So this morning, it's a little bit of a, I'm sort of almost picking up from where I left off or the mode that I was in when we looked at his trial, because I want to look at evidence today. As a police detective, my career revolved around evidence. Now that evidence could come in many different forms. Sometimes it might be a photograph, maybe a video. We had audio recordings as well, because we could do some quite clever stuff. As someone who was part involved in covert policing, it could be evidence of what we as police officers saw or heard as part of a surveillance operation. Other times it could be something that was left behind at the scene of a crime, maybe fingerprints, DNA, um, or, or, or other forensic evidence, you know, things like fibres. And sometimes if we were really lucky, the more stupid and inept offenders would leave behind important clues. I will never forget the time when I was investigating a burglary where the, the offender had broken in through a skylight on a flat roof. And this was on a three storey building. We had very little to go on to begin with until our scenes of crime officer went out onto the flat roof where they found a wallet lying right by the skylight. This had nothing at all to do with the people whose home had been broken into. And so it was carefully checked as it could give us forensic evidence. Actually, it didn't need to be forensically examined, as inside was a photo car driving licence belonging to a man who was well known for crimes such as this. Needless to say, he was arrested. Stolen property from this and other burglaries was found at his home. And in a final twist to the story, we didn't even have to go and arrest him, as he turned up at the police station to report the fact that he'd lost his wallet. I can sure you can imagine how happy we were to reunite him with it and fascinated to hear the story as how he came to lose it. Honestly, you can't believe how stupid some of them were. But that being said, the most common way in which the police come by evidence is through members of the public giving us information. Could be they were a witness to a crime. They suspect a crime is happening or they themselves have been the victim of a crime. Whatever the case may be, most investigations begin from a report being made to the police. Once that's happened, it's the duty of the police to gather all the available information to identify any suspects until a point has been reached where a decision can be made as to whether there's enough evidence to support a prosecution. And the basic test of where the case should go to trial or not is, firstly, is it in the public interest? And secondly, is there a realistic prospect of a successful prosecution? Once it's agreed it's in the public interest to prosecute, then after that, it's all about the evidence. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at Jesus's trial and saw from the very beginning that it was a travesty of justice. It wasn't in the public interest to prosecute him, but it was in the interests of the Jewish authorities to do so. There was no way he was ever gonna get a fair hearing. And the evidence as we know was pretty well exclusively fabricated or at best manipulated. There weren't any grounds to charge him, any grounds to put him on trial, let alone convict and sentence him. And yet the trial took place. He was convicted and sentenced to death. Just a few hours later, he died on the cross and his body was sealed in a tomb. But then we come to the Sunday. The stone has been rolled away. There's no sign of Jesus's body. What has happened? Has his body been taken? Or has he been resurrected just as he said he would be? The evidence for his trial was non-existent. But what about his resurrection? Was there evidence that supported what Jesus said would happen? Was there evidence that could have been presented to a court to show that Jesus rose from the dead? That's what we're going to consider today. Over this period of Lent, we've looked at the events of Holy Week 
And now we've arrived, as we know, at Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And it is this day on which our entire hope is built. John Stott says this on the subject. Christianity is, in its very essence, a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. The resurrection of Jesus confirms to us that he is indeed the son of God, just as he said he was. It also proves that his sacrifice for sin was accepted and that the work of salvation is done. For those of us who trust in him, we may live a new life because he is alive and he empowers his power to us. The resurrection of our Lord also declares to us that he is the judge who will one day come again and judge the world. That's how important this day is. So let's look at some of the evidence for it and also how yet again Jesus's enemies tried to hide the truth. And in fact, that's where we'll begin. Seeing as how crucial this day is it shouldn't really be any surprise that those who'd gone to so much lengths or so many lengths to have Jesus killed did all they could to hide the truth of his resurrection in Matthew we're told that when the chief priests found out that Jesus had risen they bribed the soldiers with a large sum of money and instructed them to go around and tell people that Jesus's disciples had come in the night and taken his body. Anyone who heard that story should have seen how ridiculous it was, because how on earth could they do it? To begin with, the tomb was carefully guarded. It'd be next to impossible for a bunch of frightened apostles, bearing in mind these people had all fled, It'd be impossible for them to overpower trained soldiers, to then open the tomb and escape with the body. And even if they could have done it, why would they? The disciples themselves didn't understand or believe that Jesus would be resurrected. Why then would they steal his body and try to uh, perpetuate such uh, an elaborate hoax? And then there was another lie that was circulated to explain what had happened. And that was that Jesus hadn't really died. He didn't die on the cross. He was just unconscious. And that when he was placed in the cool tomb, he regained consciousness. But again, how ridiculous is that? We know from Mark's gospel that when Joseph of Arimathea asked for Jesus's body, Pilate first checked with the centurion who'd been there at the execution to make sure that Jesus was dead, that Jesus had died. And this centurion confirmed to him, yes, he was dead. And then we're told, aren't we, as well, that in John's gospel, that because the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies to remain over the, on the crosses during the Sabbath, that those Roman soldiers were ordered to go and break their legs to hasten their death. And so they go and do that. They break the legs of the two criminals. But when they come to Jesus, they didn't need to. It was obvious to them he was already dead. And then other silly questions would remain unanswered. If none of that had happened and Jesus had simply come round, how did he get out of the tomb? And what was it about being laid to rest in a cold tomb that so changed Christ's body that he could simply appear and disappear and walk through closed doors, just as witnesses said that he did? No one's come up with an answer for any of that. The message of the gospel rests on the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. The apostles were sent out as witnesses of his resurrection. And the emphasis of the book of Acts is on the resurrection of Jesus. 
And that's why the climax to Luke's gospel focuses on those who were witnesses to the appearance of Jesus after he'd been raised from the dead. They're all people who could have quite easily provided witness statements as to where they were and, where, and what they saw when they encountered Jesus. And if I'd been sent in as an investigating officer, I would have been kept busy for months taking statements. Just listen to the list of witnesses and all the different sightings the Bible tells us about. He first appears to Mary Magdalene then to the other women, then to the two men on the way, on the road to Emmaus. That evening he appears to the apostles, well, all of them apart from Thomas, who wasn't there. A week later, he reappears to them again, this time especially for Thomas. He appeared to seven of the apostles when they were fishing at the Sea of Galilee. And then again, he appeared to them several times before his ascension teaching them and preparing them for their ministry. We're also told of a time when he appeared to 500 witnesses at one time. If each of those people had provided a statement, that would have amounted to a huge case file, bigger than any I ever did as an investigating officer. It'd be very interesting to see as well how many witnesses could have come forward to refute that amount. Of evidence. But let's just look a little bit closer about what Luke tells us about what happened and some of those witnesses' testimony. We don't know at what time Jesus arose from the dead on that first day of the week, but it must have been very early. The stage was set for the first witnesses to arrive on the scene and for the good news to be seen and heard. The earthquake and the angel opened the tomb, not to let Jesus out, but to let the witnesses in. Come and see, go and tell, is the Easter call to the church. Mary Magdalene had been especially helped by Jesus, and in turn she was devoted to him. She'd remained at the cross as he died. And then she was first at the tomb. With her, as we heard, were Mary, the mother of James, Joanna, and other devout women. Simply there because they hoped to finish preparing their Lord's body for burial. It was a sad labour of love that was transformed into gladness when they discovered that Jesus was alive. On their way there, they'd asked each other, who will roll the stone away? from the entrance of the tomb. There was no way at all the Roman soldiers would break the seals, especially for a group of mourning Jewish women. But God had solved the problem for them. The tomb was open and there was no body to prepare. And at this point, two angels appear on the scene. Although Matthew and Mark only mention one of the two, the one who gave the message to the women. There was a gentle rebuke in his message as he reminded them of their poor memories. More than once, Jesus had told his followers that he would suffer and die and be raised from the dead. The angel reminds them of Jesus' own words. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, on the third day be raised again. This reminder sinks home, and they at last remember what Jesus had told them. There'd been no need for them to have been so sad and devoid of hope. But in their shock and grief, they'd forgotten his words. How sad it is when we as God's people forget his word and live defeated lives. That's especially true of us today as we have the Holy Spirit to remind us of all that Jesus said. And for Mary, there was even greater proof that Jesus was alive. John tells us that while she waited by the tomb weeping, Jesus himself appeared to her. It's one thing to see the empty tomb, to see the empty grave clothes, 
one thing to be reminded what Jesus had said, but quite something else to meet the risen Christ. We can only wonder what this must have been like for this lady who so loved her Lord. But we know how she and the others responded. They're told to take the news of all they've heard and seen back to the disciples. And so, obedient to those instructions, they ran off to give them the good news. But the men are having none of it. They don't believe a word they've said. Mary Magdalene asks Peter and John to come and look for themselves. And so they go to the tomb. They too, they too see the proof that he's not there. But all the evidence tells them that was the body is gone. And that on the face of it, no one's broken in. Nothing that their eyes saw explained to them what had taken place. They too had forgotten what Jesus had told them and what the scriptures had to say. But that would change. And so we have the first evidence for the resurrection. We have the scene. We have angels saying what's happened. And we have a witness who sees and speaks to Jesus and knows full well it's him. Are they reliable witnesses? Would their testimony stand up in a court? Well, for me as one whose previous career was totally driven by evidence, I say a resounding yes. When we consider all that took place, I believe a jury could have found that it was proven beyond all reasonable doubt that Jesus was alive. I'm not alone in thinking that as the words of a former Lord Chief Justice of England make clear. These are his words. We as Christians are asked to take a very great deal on trust. The teachings, for example, and the miracles of Jesus. If we had to take all on trust, I, for one, should be sceptical. The crux of the problem of whether Jesus was or was not what he proclaimed himself to be must surely depend on the truth or otherwise of the resurrection. On that greatest point, we're not merely asked to have faith. In its favour as a living truth, there exists such overwhelming evidence, positive and negative, factual and circumstantial, that no intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in the verdict that the, resur the resurrection story is true. He was far more qualified in the law than I will ever have been. And what then is it about the account of these first witnesses that's so compelling, so believable? Well, quite simply, their testimony had to be true because they had no reason to make any of this up or to have been mistaken. We need to remember that those women, they didn't expect to see Jesus alive. They'd forgotten his resurrection promises and went to the tomb only to finish anointing his body. Some have tried to argue they were hallucinating and only thought they saw Jesus. But again, why would that be the case when all they expected to see was a dead body? And then what about all the other witnesses who would see Jesus in the days ahead? Some of them didn't believe what the women had told them. Are we expected to believe that they too suffered a similar hallucination? I would suggest that would be ridiculous. No, this group of frightened women said what they said because it really happened. This small group of women became excited witnesses, even to their own leaders, to the truth of that first Easter. Jesus Christ is alive. He has risen. That's the truth that their words proclaim to us today. 2,000 years have passed since they gave their evidence, and in all the years that have followed, no one has been able to refute what they said. The authorities tried at the time and others have tried since, 
but apart from denying or refusing to believe what they said was true, no one has provided evidence to the contrary. Their evidence is trustworthy, it is reliable, and it is believable because in the words of the oath that a witness swears in court, they told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Jesus Christ is alive. He has risen. Hallelujah. Let's pray.